Today, I want to talk about seer stones. I find it fascinating that Christians, as well as many other religions, believe in scripture that contains stories of stones, gems, and jewels with special properties. And yet, when the same thing is used in more modern times, many people find it odd or strange. The Bible has many stories of supernatural stones, including seer stones. My favorite is the one of the breastplate of judgment, also called the breastplate of Aaron. It was worn by the high priest in the tabernacle, starting with Aaron, the brother of Moses. I'll bet you've seen this painting many times, but did you ever notice the breastplate that he's wearing? The Old Testament is very specific about how it was to be created. It had 12 different semi-precious and precious stones in it, one for each of the tribes of Israel. The names of the twelve tribes were engraven on the stones as well as other engravings. Additionally, opals were worn on both shoulders and the high priest also had a Urim and Thummim which was held in a pocket in the breastplate. The high priest would enter the Holy of Holies wearing the breastplate and according to some sources could look through the Urim and Thummim at the breastplate to get messages from God. I don't want to go into too much detail here because I'm thinking about making a video just on that subject because I find it so interesting. According to the Targums, which are Jewish Aramaic translations of books of the Hebrew Bible, Peter and John both had single stone seership. These traditions make it seem likely Peter had a single stone seer stone, which John was made aware of. Peter may have discovered the stone on his own or been given it by the Lord at the Mount of Transfiguration. There are even some interesting changes in the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible that further indicate this about Peter and John. Accounts of special stones are in every single book of Scripture that we have. In addition to those in the Bible, the Book of Mormon has stories of the brother of Jared, not only with the Urim and Thummim, but also the famous story of the Lord touching the 16 stones to illuminate the ships as they crossed the ocean into the Promised Land. Additionally, we know that Mosiah the first and Mosiah the second, Alma the younger, and Helaman, and Moroni all had seer stones. The Pearl of Great Price also has accounts of seer stones that Abraham had, as well as the one that Moses and Aaron had. Doctrine and Covenants section 130 talks about a white stone that all the faithful who achieved the celestial kingdom will be given, upon which will be written a new name. This stone is a Urim and Thummim for that person. Scripture also talks about the earth being celestialized as a great Urim and Thummim. The Doctrine and Covenants also discusses the use of seer stones as well as other supernatural artifacts, such as the gift of Aaron. There are lots of supernatural artifacts found across scripture, such as the Ark of the Covenant, the Staff of Aaron, the Brazen Serpent, and the Liahona, just to name a few. This would be another fun idea for a video, so let's not spoil it here. We believe in these books of scripture. We believe these men to be prophets of God, and they used seer stones and other sacred objects. So why is it that when Joseph Smith used a seer stone, people find it odd or feel uncomfortable about it? There is clearly something about our modern day society that shuns magical objects as fake or fiction. And when those stories are associated with the restoration of the church and the translation of the Book of Mormon, it can unnerve some people's testimonies. One reason might be that many in the church today saw pictures like this and naturally assumed Joseph, using the Urim and Thummim, was staring at the characters on the gold plates and seeing an English version of what was written, which he dictated to a scribe. This is in fact not how the process worked at all, as many of us now know. Some feel the church was purposefully deceiving people, but I believe the reality is that natural assumptions of people combined with popular LDS culture and art and traditions led to this belief. Certain church historians may have also emphasized certain aspects of translation and de-emphasized others based on their own fears and beliefs at the time, having nothing to do with directives from the church presidency. With the internet, social media, and other modern technologies, those that did know the truth would share it. And then some that heard this for the first time through those mediums felt misled or betrayed. Yet I think that the church has done everything they can to be transparent. You look at the books like The Saints and the Joseph Smith Papers, the church really has tried to give the resources with anyone that wants to learn as much as they want. So what do we know about the seer stones and Joseph Smith? First, we know that Moroni directed Joseph to a box in the hill Camorra, where he found the gold plates, but also a breastplate and the Urim and Thummim. 
The idea when Moroni buried them was that he was preserving these things for a future day when somebody would need to translate the plates and that they would need the Urim and Thummim. Joseph Smith's mother, Lucy Mack Smith, described the Urim and Thummim this way, two smooth three-corner diamonds set in glass, and the glasses were set in silver bows, connected with each other in much the same way as old-fashioned spectacles are made. According to the record, Joseph found the breastplate burdensome and disconnected the Urim and Thummim from it while he translated. The prophet Joseph Smith used these to translate the first 116 pages of the Book of Mormon. This is the portion that Martin Harris lost. Moroni collected the plates and the Urim and Thummim from Joseph. When Moroni returns the plates to Joseph to resume translation, it isn't clear whether he also returned the Urim and Thummim or not. Emma Smith, the prophet's wife, later in life, described it this way. Now, the first that my husband translated the book was translated by the Urim and Thummim, and that was the part that Martin Harris lost. After that, he used a small stone, not exactly black, but was rather a dark color. In other words, Joseph Smith used the Urim and Thummim given him by Moroni to translate the 116 pages that are now lost. And the rest of the Book of Mormon, the entire Book of Mormon that you have and you've read your entire life, was not translated using the Urim and Thummim, but rather this other seer stone. It can be confusing because even Joseph referred to these and other stones all as Urim and Thummim, or seer stones interchangeably. This is the actual seer stone that Emma is referring to that Joseph likely used in the translation of the Book of Mormon after the 116 pages. Joseph kept it in a small pouch. In fact, this was one of two main seer stones that Joseph had. The other was semi-transparent. While we know one seer stone or another was used at various times, only that statement from Emma leads us to believe it is the dark brown seer stone that was used for the translation of the Book of Mormon. Using seer stones or peep stones was a rather common practice in those days and area of the country. There are many stories of those that use similar stones for a variety of purposes, often to find lost things. There are a few conflicting stories about how Joseph got the stones, where and which stones from which location. And in the end, I don't even think it matters that much. But as best as I can tell, the first one, the brown stone, was found near Lake Erie between 1819 and 1820. Then, using that stone, he found the other stone in 1822 while digging a well with his brother Alvin on the William Chase property. Some believe that the white seer stone was found near Lake Erie and the brown stone at the bottom of the well. But I'll tell you why I believe the brown stone was found near Lake Erie and the white stone 20 feet down at the bottom of the well. This seer stone is iron banded jasper. It is made of alternating bands of iron, either magnetite or hematite, and jasper, a brown opaque quartz crystal. It is more commonly called a Genesis stone. See, during the formation of the earth, there is a specific period of time when iron banded jasper came from and no other time. It is right as the oceans were oscillating between having enough oxygen from blue-green algae and not having enough oxygen. At this tipping point in the Earth's creation, those banded layers form. When there is enough oxygen, you get the iron layers. When there isn't, you get the chet or the jasper layer. Some cyclical pattern allows the layers to form while the oxygen built up in the Earth. This happened right about 2.4 billion years ago, and like I said, iron-banded jasper can only form under these unique conditions. So if you have iron-banded jasper, you know it was right around 2.4 billion years ago. It has never formed before or since. It is called a Genesis stone because this unique time when it can form is in the Bible, in Genesis 1-6, where God is dividing the waters from the waters and an atmosphere is being formed. This type of stone marks a point in Genesis for the creation of the world. Genesis stones are actually considered fossils, as the black iron layer has algae fossil in it, but it can only be seen under a microscope. This type of Genesis stone can only be found in three places in North America, Wyoming, Michigan, and Canada, west of Ottawa. Palmyra, New York is here, and it is said he found the seer stone near Lake Erie to the west. Genesis stone is found in these areas. The shape is also unique. 
iron-banded jasper naturally looks more like this. In fact, one day I said, you know it would be a cool idea? I should grind this down into the same shape as Joseph Smith's seerstone so I can have a replica from the exact same material. I can't tell you how many hours of my life I lose that start out, you know what would be a cool idea? It took me more than a dozen hours and like 30 grinding belts to get it down to this. Think about it. This is iron. It doesn't want to grind down. But this is my replica from the same iron banded jasper. So how did Joseph's Genesis seer stone get this shape? Remember that he found it this way. Researchers have two theories on how that could have happened. The first is that being found near Lake Erie, it may over time have been subject to water currents that could have shaped it like that. Although with most rocks that are shaped by river currents, they turn out more flat. The other theory states that there are certain types of animals, especially species of birds, that actually swallow rocks, and these rocks aid in the digestion of their food as they knock around in their belly between the rocks and the food. And that same action can shape the rock in this way. Except the size of this stone would have been an awfully large bird. So the people who theorize this say that it would have been swallowed by a dinosaur, which have now been found to be more closely related to birds than lizards and other animals. So perhaps something like this gave the Genesis stone a special shape. This is also one explanation of how a stone like that could travel a bit south. But look, that is all speculation. So regardless of how it got its shape, it is very unique. No wonder Joseph was attracted to it. It was this seer stone that led him to his other seer stone that he found in that well. Assuming it was the Genesis stone, as Emma states, Joseph would place it into a hat and then peer into it. The hat made it so it was darker and he could see the writing on the stone more clearly. Whether it was like this or like this or like this, I don't know. And to me, it doesn't matter. He had a special gift from youth to be able to use these stones and the hat just made it a bit easier. The gold plates needed to be nearby, but they were usually covered in a napkin while Joseph would look at the stone inside the hat. And the words would appear on it and he would dictate to a scribe. While Joseph and many others called this the translation process, it isn't a traditional translation because Joseph didn't know both Reformed Egyptian and English and looked at the characters and determined the right words and phrases in English. They called it this because it was their process to get the Book of Mormon into English. But today, a transliteration is probably a more accurate term. For those who don't like that this is the process used, look at 2 Nephi 27.20, which is Nephi giving Isaiah 29. So this is really Isaiah speaking of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. It says, quote, Then shall the Lord God say unto him, The learned shall not read them, for they have rejected them, and I am able to do my own work. Wherefore, thou shalt read the words which I shall give unto thee. He didn't say he would give him the ability to translate languages or have the scholarly education to translate an ancient record. He said that Joseph would read the words God would give unto him, and that is exactly what happened. In fact, Urim and Thummim means lights and perfections or truths. And I love it when the name of something describes it perfectly. Some might ask why he didn't need the plates at all if he didn't need to look at them or use them in any way. Look, no one knows 100%, but it does seem to me that there needs to be a reference object or something there for the transliteration process to work. When Moroni took the plates, he still had the brown stone, but he couldn't transliterate. Likewise, when he had the scrolls and the mummy from Egypt, perhaps another video for another day, he used the same process of transliteration to bring forth the Book of Abraham. Shortly after the process of transliteration of the Book of Mormon was complete, he gave the Genesis seer stone to Oliver Cowdery. While some wonder if the white stone was used rather than this Genesis stone, and perhaps it was, the fact that Joseph gives the stone to Oliver, who was the translator for all of the, that portion of the Book of Mormon that the seer stone was used for, it seems to indicate that it was the brown stone. Some also wonder why he would have given it away at all. I personally feel two reasons for this. From other accounts, it does seem that the white seer stone was more of Joseph's favorite. He kept it throughout his life. 
Also, it would seem that a seer stone acts almost as a training wheel for a seer to help them develop this special gift. Once that gift is fully developed, it would seem that the stone is no longer necessary to continue or receive revelation. Joseph no longer needed it. For example, the book of Moses was revealed and transcribed without the use of any seer stone at all. So what happened to the seer stones? Well, as we discussed, the angel Moroni took back the Urim and Thummim with the plates and other artifacts. The white seer stone, that was presumably Joseph's favorite for several reasons, was with him until his death. In 1887, Wilford Woodruff, succeeding John Taylor as prophet and president of the church, was given both Joseph's Genesis seer stone and the white seer stone. Soon after he became president of the church, he carried the white seer stone to Manti, Utah, where he consecrated it on the altar of the temple. It is believed that the first presidency has this seer stone to this day. The Genesis seer stone was given to Oliver Cowdery. After his death in 1850, Oliver's brother-in-law, Phineas Young, obtained the stone from Oliver's widow, Elizabeth Whitmer Cowdery. Phineas Young gave it to Brigham Young, who kept it until his death. Zina D.H. Young, one of Brigham's wives, and her daughter Zina Williams Card, then donated the Genesis seer stone and the white seer stone to the church. The Genesis seer stone shown here is still owned by the church today. In summary, I think the seer stones are super cool. Between history, scripture, and the pure awesomeness factor, I don't know why anybody finds the use of special stones to be strange or weird. It all seems directly in line with how things have always been and always will be. Thanks for watching.